Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Us on Social Media. This is Ashley. And uh, we're here doing another <laughs> Q&A session today. So we'll take, uh, Ashley will field your questions. We're on a live on a couple of different social media channels. So Ashley's got to field the questions in from a couple of different sources and then she'll reload, relay those to me. And we'll do our best to answer those photography related questions. Yes, please. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're also going to announce the winners of our photography competition technology. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've got some prizes uh, we're going to announce, announce who's won that. Um, but before we get any questions coming in, so fire your photography related questions in, we'll do our best to answer that. Um, let's look at a couple of things that we've got coming up that might be of interest to you. Um, tomorrow night, we're doing another live workshop. We are, yes, an exciting one. An exciting slightly, slightly one. Slightly different, I would say, as well. Yes, slightly different. Um, we're doing a legs photography workshop. Um, this will be live uh, on Carl Taylor Education, how to photograph legs. Now, that's actually more difficult than it sounds. Yeah. Um, you've got lots of things to consider in terms of the skin color, the, the moisturizer, the, the shape of the legs, and crucially, the um, angle of the legs and the mm -hmm. shapes that you make with the legs, because that's kind of what defines legs photography, if you like. So we've got uh, a model coming in. Well, she's not even a professional model, um, sort of girl off the street. Um, one of, <laughs> not quite, no, off not the quite street. that sort of girl off the street, <laughs> but uh, a girl off the street who's a friend of one of our staff here. And she's agreed to uh, model for us. And I think it'll be a great demonstration because what we'll be able to do is she has no idea about modeling. No, so I'll not. have to be directing her how we're gonna position the legs to get the best angles. We're gonna be looking at things like different types of tights and stockings and shoes, configurations, uh, uh, makeup, creams, all of those sort of things that would enhance uh, that legs shoot. So that's gonna be live uh, tomorrow evening at six o'clock UK time, one o'clock um, New York time. Um, so if you can join us for that show over on carltaylereducation.com, I'm sure that's going to be a lot of fun and quite, uh, quite an interesting one as well. Um, what else? Emma wanted me to mention our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group for our members on Carl Taylor Education. And here they've been posting some great examples of their work for critique and um, you know, sharing their work with other members. And I often jump in there and critique the work that's been posted from members in our group. The group is still new, so it's still growing. But if you're a member on Carl Taylor Education, get on that Facebook group because it's turning into a great little community where everyone's yeah. helping each other. It's really and constructive as yeah, well. Yeah, very yeah, constructive. Very supportive and people can ask their questions, as you say, post their pictures and everything. It's exactly. Nice and the, extra element. Yeah, they seem to be enjoying it in there as well, talking about it. And I kind of like, um, I think that the groups section of Facebook is actually more interesting than Facebook itself yeah. these days. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, if you're a member on Carl Taylor Education already, uh, you can use our Facebook group get your work in there, other members critique it, I'll critique it, um, and we're yeah, trying to grow that uh, group, so um, check that out as well. Now, um, what else have we got? We haven't got any questions coming yet. No, no? questions okay. that I can see yet. Fire your questions in for our Q&A. Last, <laughs> last time we, uh, we did this, we had thousands of questions. Yeah, we really... I mean, we ran out of the ability to answer them all because we ran out of time. We did like an hour-long marathon of uh, answering photography related questions. Um, right, while we're uh, waiting on that, I wanna talk about a couple of other amazing things that are coming up as well. We have got a really, really good lineup of guests coming on the show we soon, do. haven't we? Yeah, it's um, some big names, yeah. really big names. Um, in October, that's this month now, yes, it's October soon. already, very soon. Um, the end of October, we have uh, Jonathan Knowles. Now, if you don't know Jonathan Knowles, then uh, you seriously don't know 
product photography because Jonathan Knowles is one of the big names in product photography in London. He shot big campaigns for all the big brands, cosmetics, drink companies, telecommunications. This is some of his amazing work. And you know, obviously I'm a product photographer, so I'm a big fan of Jonathan's work. He's been around for a long time, um, shooting at the top of his game for many, many years. He also does a lot of really good beauty stuff mm. as well. And it's gonna be really exciting interviewing Jonathan, talking about his work live on the show. And the great thing about the live shows is Jonathan will be sat there on the sofa, uh, I'll be asking him questions, and our audience get to ask him questions as well. Sort of like this, but better. <laughs> Much better than this, because the production values go through the roof. <laughs> and you'll have Jonathan instead of me. <laughs> exactly. So we'll, we'll have uh, a really interesting show with Jonathan. And I know we have a large product photography following mm. in our membership, because obviously we do a lot of tutorials on that. Um, so I'm sure a lot of uh, people are going to be very interested to hear what um, Jonathan's got to say. Um, but after Jonathan, we've got even more amazing guests yes. as well. Uh, we have, um, after Jonathan in December, we've got a guy called Eric Johansson. Now, I'm sure people have heard of Eric Johansson because this guy is very, very famous in the sort of um, compositing, fantasial photography creations. And what he does is some incredible work. I'm sure you've seen his work before. I mean, some of it's just absolutely stunning. I mean, it, it, it's composite work, it's montage together. But what he does is he shoots all the elements himself, shoots yeah. them all separately, lights them, works on them, and then he builds them all together in these layers in Photoshop. And if we, I mean, he calls it surreal photography. That's what he calls mm -hmm. it, which is a great way of describing, uh, describing his images. Um, so we'll take a, another look at some of his work a little bit later on. But Eric's going to be on the show uh, in December and it's going to be a pleasure to interview him, talk about his work and um, find out some of his techniques and some of his tips as well on there. Um, right, uh, after Eric, the, the list goes on, <laughs> on and on about these amazing guests that are flocking to Carl Taylor Education to be interviewed. I mean, to be fair, they're not flocking. I ask <laughs> them, I know some of these people and I say, hey, would you like to come on the show as a guest? Because our members and our audience would love to hear your point of view on the industry and tips and techniques. After Eric, in the new year, we have Camilla, um, she's on the show. She's a great architectural and fashion photographer. Mm -hmm. And then in March, we have world famous Rachel Smith on the show as well. Now, Rachel is like the, you know, you, you, you can't, you, you'd, it'd be quicker to write a list of who she hasn't shot for <laughs> than who she shot for because yeah. Rachel has shot for Cosmo, uh, Harper's Bazaar, all the, all the big magazines. She shoots um, celebrity portraits, famous people, amazing glamour portrait work, fashion work. Uh, Elle magazine you can see there as well. Um, so she's a big name in the world of fashion, beauty and portrait work. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be an absolute pleasure to uh, interview Rachel as well. Um, so she's coming on the show in March. I'm really looking forward to welcoming, welcoming her and uh, interviewing her as well. Right, um, shall we take some questions? We shall, we've got a few that have come in. Okay, let's go for it. Um, the first one we've had before, but it seems something that people ask again and again. Um, hi, Carl and Ashley, this is from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. They want to know, is it okay to photograph branded products and put those photos in my portfolio? Yeah, we have had that question many times. Um, I think uh, we did a video a while ago for we YouTube did. on top 10 common most photography questions and we answered it there, but we will an I'll answer it again. Um, as an example, most commercial photographers like myself or Jonathan Knowles maybe, Barry Macario, another product photographer that we know, um, most of them will shoot what we call speculative work as well. Mm -hmm. That is, they'll shoot work for practice, test reasons, and then they may well send that work to that potential manufacturer or client and say, hey, what do you think of this? So that happens. And quite often we put those pictures into our portfolio. And I would say that I've never had an issue with it. We've not had any brands say, you know, remove that. I think the key to it 
is if the images are good. At the end of the day, I, su I suppose it's just free advertising for these brands yeah. when we do that. But it would be if you represented the, the brand in a negative way, then obviously that wouldn't be good. So I would expect the photography standards have to be very high mm -hmm. and the work has to be very good. And then it's probably acceptable and you're not going to get in any trouble. So um, really, I think it's just a bit of common sense. You know, if the, if the, if the, if the brand is projected positively, then I can't really see no. there's, there's going to be an issue with it. Okay, next one is from Mike Pierce. Basic question, where would you try to make money in photography if you were starting today as a product photographer? Well, I'm, that's, that's a long, could be a long-winded question. Probably best to ask Jonathan Knowles, actually, yeah, when, he's on, good one, when actually. he's on the show. That would be a good one for him. Um, but, I mean, in my sphere as a product photographer, I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, well, I don't know if it's 25 years in the studio. Over 20 years in the studio. And I started out with, uh, you know, a lot smaller uh, range of clients and more local clients. And then that expanded, then started working for bigger advertising agencies, more projects in London, further afield, bigger clients. And it just sort of grew. So it was a gradual process. But the very fact of product photography, the answer's in the question, really, products, okay? Mm -hmm. You're shooting things that people manufacture. That can be actual physical items, or it can be a service element as well. But generally, it's things that people make, build, and want to sell and market. So you have to identify the market that is immediate to your vicinity, which is probably the most useful. So look for manufacturing organizations. Quite often as well, you can get information, good information from trade bodies. Um, there's usually confederations of industry, trade shows you can go to, find out who's building what, who's doing what, who's manufacturing in your area, etc. And then back in the day, I used to, it goes back almost to the other question, I used to shoot speculatively for certain brands that I thought this could be a good client, this is a client I could win. So I would look at what they've got out there at the moment, judge the standard of their work, figure out you know, the sort of costs they might be paying for that work, shoot it myself, and then submit it and try to arrange meetings. And I think the mm -hmm. key thing is arranging meetings with art directors. Yeah. When you talk about product photography, you've got two routes. One is um, you're potentially going to deal directly with the client, which is what I do with some of the larger clients where they've got their own in-house marketing and creative teams, or you're going to be dealing with an advertising agency and an art director. So you've got two routes into the market there. One is direct with some of the bigger brands, and the other one is find out which ad agencies handle brands that you might like to shoot for. So say, for instance, you're big in liquids and whiskey or you know drinks photography, then find out who's, who's the agent mm -hmm. handling it and try to make appointments with those. You've obviously got to demonstrate your skill. You can't just turn up and say, hey, I want to shoot for you. And they go, great, let's see what you can do. You need to have some work. So th again, the focus is always on producing great work, presenting that great work. Um, but it isn't as simple as just having a website or a great Instagram account. You know, you have to make the appointments, you have to knock on doors, you have to be a little bit tenacious and, 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 and really, you know, make an effort to get those appointments and, and just keep doing it. Don't take no for an answer. If you really believe your work is good enough, keep sticking at it. When you get a knockback, and this is the interesting thing, is you have to be prepared to accept that you don't get a response and don't consider that a knockback. Consider mm -hmm. that they may have just been busy yeah. and they didn't see your email or they didn't get your letter or they didn't get your brochure or whatever and you have to phone them and you have to chase them down and then you've got to keep doing it and you keep doing it until you get an answer. But the key crucial thing is not just doing everything by email. I think it's like making phone calls, following up emails or following up a mail shot that you sent mm -hmm. in. That Those are the sort of things that open doors uh, and those sort of personal relationships that you build. But again, it all comes down to the quality of the work. You know, if your work's good enough and you're competitive, then it's back to that supply and demand thing. Okay, next one. Razor2048 
says, for strobes that support TTL, why is the manual output power range more limited than the TTL range when it comes to getting lower output? Many can go one stop lower than the manual minimum. I, I've not heard of that, to be honest. Um, as far as I'm aware, on any speed light or any studio light that I've used, I mean, the studi studio lighting as a great example generally doesn't have TTL. TTL in studio lighting, there are some lights that have TTL in, and I don't see the point of it. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't think if you're using studio lighting, you already understand about flash power and the fact that you just turn the power up or turn the power down to suit, and you're usually building a shot and then you know adjusting the power of each light in the set when you've got TTL it's TTL stands for through the lens and it's usually associated with through the lens metering and therefore uh, the camera senses how much light has come into the exposure and cuts the flash off it's not very accurate generally it's okay for an on-camera flash maybe for an events photographer mm -hmm. but in a four light setup I could never really understand why anyone would want to use TTL. I'd want to be manually adjusting the flash. And when I've manually adjusted speed lights, you can you know, drop the power one to one, one half, quarter, right down to one sixty-fourth or whatever it is uh, in their range. And that's how I control the power of my lighting exactly the same way as I control it on my studio lighting. So the first question I'd be asking yourself is, do you really need to use TTL? Is it something very specific that you controlling it manually doesn't cover it? As for the reasons, the technical reasons why this person's finding TTL goes lower in exposure than manual, I don't know, or yeah. vice versa. I'm not sure. Lower output. I, I, I've no idea. I've not experienced that, so I'm afraid I can't answer it. But I would just suggest don't bother with TTL. Get flash power manual. Flash shouldn't really overwhelm people. At the end of the day, flash is like volume on a music system. You turn it up, you turn it down to your required preference. Um, and that's how I manage flash. Okay, the next one is from Daniel Majewski saying, Dear Carl and Ash, wow. thank you for your help. I've been struggling with tethered capture in Lightroom in my calibrated laptop. It seems to be well lit, but when I see them in my other computer, which is also calibrated, it appears to be underexposed. What should I do? Because I actually bought my Surface to being able to take photos anywhere and then do the post-production on my other computer. What's your recommendation? So I think he's talking about, is it like a Surface tablet or something? I'm guessing so, so he might so, be yes. shooting tethered into that and then he's not getting the same results. So kind of similar to say, having the images come in in an iPad and then looking at them on a calibrated screen, they are going to be different. I, I think at the end of the day, calibration is fine, but how well a monitor or a screen can be calibrated is largely dependent on the screen itself. Not everything is capable of being fully calibrated in the same way that a top um, NEC or ISO monitor can be, because those monitors are designed for pre-press um, you know, work to check what this stuff's gonna look like in print. Stuff that's destined for an iPad or a MacBook Pro or a Surface tablet, it's never ever been built with the intention of needing to view something in that same way. So you have to have a little bit of awareness of that and a little bit of flexibility on that. And the other thing as well is look at the histogram, okay? If you're thinking that what's actually happening and, and when you look at it on your calibrated monitor, your proper monitor, it looks under, well, just check the histogram when you're shooting into the Surface tablet or whatever the other device is and see if the histogram represents what the screen is displaying. And then you can kind of figure out which monitor is, is right and which one is wrong. Um, but unfortunately, not all monitors are built equally. No. And I wouldn't consider shooting, I mean, I shoot tethered on location sometimes, if I have to, into a MacBook Pro, simply because we need That's portability. What, yeah. There's no way I can drag the ISO <laughs> out in the middle of the desert or somewhere and, and have it plugged into to, to the MacBook Pro. So I have to accept the limitations of the MacBook Pro, but I will keep an eye on the histogram and I will just see that things look like they should look. And you know, I sort of accept that you know, it's never gonna be the same as it looks on the ISO, but you have to trust one of them in your supply chain. And obviously I trust the ISO as the last thing in the supply chain for those final tweaks. Okay, next question is from Ingo Donath saying, 
are you planning a, a tutorial about the UV attachment from Broncolor? Um, no, but we have got one on the UV attachment that we did with Broncolor with Oars Wrecker on one of our how-to videos. Um, you'll find that on our platform. You'll also find it on our YouTube channel and you'll find it on Broncolor's how-to section on their website. So Oars demonstrates the UV attachment and how you can use it. Um, the, the purpose, the way he uses it is to actually um, brighter illuminate white lingerie and underwear because it reflects UV light more. So he makes it stand out more without lighting the model's skin as much. And it's quite a clever technique. But there are many photographers that use the UV attachment for artistic reasons where they paint models with UV colored paint mm -hmm. and bring out weird sort of um, looks and styles on that. Um, I don't have the UV attachment. It's such a specialist accessory that I really wouldn't have much use for it. So in answer to your question, no, we don't plan to bring out one unless we get thousands of our members saying, yes, we want a, a tutorial on that. But if you want to check out the Broncolor how-to video, as I said, you'll find that on our YouTube channel, their YouTube channel, or on Broncolor's website um, on one of the previous how-to videos. Craig Dockerell is interested in watch photography um, and asks, do you have any ideas how they can get their hands on a Rolex watch to photograph? Well, you're not having mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, borrow them, borrow them. Um, if I've got a really good relationship with one of the local jewelers, um, Ray and Scott, and they lend me jewelry that you wouldn't believe. I mean, I come back out of there with 50 <laughs> grand's worth of watches sometimes. Um, and they're happy to do it because um, I give them photos from it. So, and I, I, I'm, I'm, because they've loaned me this stuff for test shoots or for live shows, I'm mm -hmm. quite happy for them to use the images. And they've ended up using some of the images in their advertising as well. Um, so I think build a relationship with a good jeweler that sells this stuff and uh, show them what you can do. And uh, if you can build that relationship, you can say, look, you know, I, can give you these images to use yeah. in return for the favor of letting me borrow the stuff. Um, so that's the way I would tackle it. Otherwise, you're just gonna have to walk around Chelsea or Knightsbridge in London and try and find some people who might have one on and ask them. <laughs> can I borrow <laughs> probably this not, <laughs> Probably not the way to go at all, actually. I'd, I'd probably build a relationship with a jeweler would be the best way. Probably easiest and, and, and the safer. O the other thing as well, though, it doesn't have to be a top brand mm. watch um, to, um, to do it. Um, you, you, there are many very attractive watches, designery watches that are sort of less expensive that you might be able to also use for your tests and that. I don't think it's imperative. It has to be a Blanc Pan or a, you know, IWC Amiga. watch or whatever, you know. Might be good to start with those uh, cheaper brands as well to build up again your portfolio and show what you're capable of yeah, doing to help build that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Scott Steinweiss is asking, do extension tubes give a larger depth of field or do they reduce it? Uh, they reduce depth of field because what an extension tube does, it's a spacer between the lens and the camera um, so that you're pushing the lens further away from the sensor. And in doing so, you lose infinity focus, you lose the far away focus, but you gain closer focusing. And when you gain closer focusing, you're increasing magnification. Whenever you increase magnification, you lose depth of field. That's basically the rule. As soon as you have more magnification, you have less depth of field. So that's also the reason why a 200 mil lens will have less depth of field because it's a higher magnification. So yes, you lose depth of field, um, but you wouldn't lose depth of field a great deal more than the equivalent say macro lens because a macro lens is also increasing magnification it's designed in a way that it's meant to be more flat field and uh, more appropriate for macro work so you may notice some slight advantage with a dedicated macro lens but i use extension tubes all the time for my close-up work no problem at all um okay Mustafa Tobiani is saying, what is your idea about virtual product photography and lighting in 360 degree shoots? Um, well, virtual product photography, I'm assuming he's talking about, um, you know, for e-commerce type things where you do 360 spins of the product on a turntable. Um, and what often happens for that is 
people that are e-commerce sites selling products, people want to be able to grab the product and spin it around and look at it from all sides. And that's become very popular um, in, in recent years, so much so that actually um, a lot of the lighting brands are looking at e-commerce solutions for their clients. Again, we were just in Switzerland the other week mm -hmm. and we were making some new how-to videos for Broncolor. A couple of them related directly to e-commerce and some e-commerce lighting setups with continuous lighting and, and also with flash lighting. Um, the difficulty with that type of 360 lighting is that the lighting can't really change while the object spins, otherwise no. it looks odd. But then the lighting for one angle of the product is not Mind necessarily it. the best for another angle. So yeah. you have to compromise a little bit and say, well, what is the best lighting for the whole thing, if you like? Or what is the best, you know, the most prominent face of the object that you're going to start with? Maybe light for that and then just accept that. But generally, it's going to be a pretty much more of an all around wrap around lighting. Quite often that's done in a light tent or a light cone or something like that, or surrounded by acrylic panels and, and, and soft boxes, if that's what he means. Um, OK, our next question is from Robert Popskew saying, did you ever think to make a shared calendar for all of this? By this, I assume they mean everything we've got coming up. Um, um, we that, sort of have on the website, you can see everything that's yeah, coming. Yeah, I mean, let's, I mean, to be straight honest with you, everything that we've got coming up in our live shows is listed in our live shows. Um, we don't have a calendar saying what is coming up in terms of new courses, but we are obviously always releasing new courses. But if you look here in our live shows page, you can see the previous show, the next live show, uh, and coming soon. And then all the dates of all the coming live shows are listed here all the way through to next year. And then all of the archive shows from all the previous live shows are there available on replay. And all of our guest interviews with top photographers from around the world are all there on archive as well, as well as our member critiques, which are very popular live shows too. So they're all there listed in the live show section. If it comes to our actual courses, then, um, for example, here we've got a whole range of new individual Photoshop courses which are going down well, specifically on certain tools like how to use curves, how to use mask selections, uh, how to use the pen tool is one that people get stuck on, so we've got one of those. Those say coming soon on it because they're coming soon. We haven't got the exact release date on all of those because Ben is so busy with thousands of videos to edit that um, you know they're released gradually in order, um, usually in the order you see them on the website. So you can usually ascertain from just looking at our website what's going on, what's coming soon. But I, I suppose a calendar, if we could build a calendar in the website that said, got this, got this, got this, yeah, not, it's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. Cool. Yeah. So thanks for that. Um, okay, then iPhantom Amur is saying, I have an important question. <laughs> How can I introduce my skills and my portfolio to A plus clients? What they're saying is they've already been dealing with lower grade clients, so how do they get it to more top end, bigger clients? Well, I think we answered that earlier with the um, question of how do you get your work out there with product photography. Yeah. You've got to present really good portfolio of work. You can't just email them your website. If you're going for the very big clients, art directors, ad agencies, in-house teams of uh, big uh, companies that you'd like to work for, um, I used to produce these big, heavy, leather-bound or acrylic-bound portfolios, and I had multiple copies of them. And if I was aiming one at a drinks company or aiming one at a jewelers or cosmetics, I'd have the portfolio tailored more towards that sort of work, and then you'd send that portfolio out. If it's an ad agency, because they deal with multiple different clients, then you have all your best work in there. And I used to send these out by courier, They'd arrive at a certain art director, hopefully land on his desk, and when he's getting this huge, big, very expensively produced portfolio, you know they're going to have to look at it. It's not something they're going to throw in the bin, and it's not something that is going to go missing. It's there on their desk. And then I'd normally follow that up with um, phone calls and trying to arrange a meeting to go in and talk to them, that sort of thing. So um, it's, a, it's just getting your work presented in the right way 
and not relying so much on just digital output or relying on expecting someone to click a link you send them in an email because that's never going to work okay no. i get like 100 <laughs> emails a day and um you know sometimes you miss them you don't see them whatever so you've got to you you have to invest a little bit i'm afraid in your marketing in producing either brochures printed material portfolios and getting it in front of people and you have to obviously if you're going for these bigger clients the work has to be right up there. yeah it has to be yeah. higher grade um the next question is from George A saying, if I want an out of focus background, but not compromise my focus, are they better off with a telephoto lens? No, not, not, not necessarily. I mean, it, he didn't say what he was thinking of photographing. No. If it's people, then I'd avoid a telephoto lens because people start to get chunkier looking on telephoto lenses. As soon as you start getting above that 135 mil focal length on 35 mil, people start to get a little bit block-headed looking, you know? Um, and then if you go the other direction where you're on wide angle, then features start getting a little bit pronounced. So you've got to find that sweet spot, which is usually in the sort of 65 to 100 mil range on 35 mil format. Um, so if it's products, again, using a telephoto lens for product photography puts you a long way away from the product. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the the word perspective has more value to it than people realize the perspective view on a product changes dramatically based on how far away you are so for example if you were photographing me and you were with a shorter telephoto lens you'll be closer to me and you wouldn't see my ears necessarily as much but at a further distance you would see the so, so the way things look changes dramatically based on focal length and some focal lengths are just no good for stuff. You can use a long telephoto stuff for a sports photography, wildlife stuff, but it's not the sort of lens I'd be considering for portraiture or product photography. So you need to understand what the characteristics of the lens will offer you in terms of uh, revealing the best of a particular product. When it comes to depth of field control, you have a couple of choices in, in product photography. You can either go down the technical route of using view cameras and technical cameras with tilt and shift so that you can use shine flug theory to set your depth of field plane on a particular angle that matches the flow of your product um, or you can use focus stacking if it's a still life if it's a person i don't see any reason why you're not able to control your depth of field sufficiently and if you're concerned by the sounds of it their concern was backgrounds then move yeah. further away from the background that's that's your, you, you know, if you want to increase your depth, let, let's say this is your person and your camera is here and your background is here and your depth of field, you want to get it past the person, but it's ending up making the background too sharp, then move the person further away and then the depth of field doesn't reach the background as much. Now, you may not have the space for that. That may be your problem. But at the end of the day, we cannot... We can't break the laws of physics. We can only deal with, if you need a certain thing sharp, then that's the depth of field you're going to work to. So whenever I set a shot up, if I'm doing a fashion shot and it's a beauty shot, I'm likely going to be at F16 because I want all the skin sharp. I don't want just the eyes sharp. If I'm doing an, an arty portrait, I might drop down to F4. So I've only got the eyes and the nose and the lips sharp. So I'm making the decision on the depth of field I'm going to use first, and then I'm adjusting the light power to suit that. On a product shoot where I'm in really close or it might be a small product, then I'm generally going f16 because I'm looking for the sweet spot quality of the lens, sometimes to f22. And if it's uh, the depth of field's not great enough, then I'm going to look at either tilt and shift or I'm going to look at focus stacking to achieve it. So uh, there are limitations in photography due to physics and you have to work out what those limitations are and not compromise the image by thinking in terms of focal length. That would be the wrong way to go about it. Uh, next question is from Bjorn Harvalsden, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, they're wanting to know if there's any chance that we would make any tutorials regarding Capture One. They say, I've started using it since I like to shoot tethered more and more, but some how-tos would be wonderful since I'm used to Lightroom and struggle a bit editing in Capture One. And they also say, great shows. They really help them learn a lot. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Capture One, I've only used it a couple of times. I'm not a massive... Um, 
fan or user of it because I use Focus, which mm -hmm. is sort of similar to Capture One, but it's the, the Hasselblad proprietary system for their own cameras. Um, I think we've got a copy of Capture One somewhere, so um, we will consider it. I'll have to have a play around with it again. But to be honest, they are all fairly similar in my book. You know, you've got your recovery, highlight, shadow control, color control. Um, you know, once you understand about RGB colors and opposite colors and exposure, you know, it's all very similar to what you can do in Photoshop or in the raw file processor. It's just the stuff's in different places in different positions. I think what might be different in Capture One is it's also like a cataloging system like Lightroom. So that might take a little bit more work to get your head around. But I'm pretty sure if I plugged Capture One in and used it straight away with a camera, as soon as I knew where the palettes were, the stuff you have to do is the same, yeah. you know, but we'll consider it, we'll consider it. Um, next question is from Gurav Kumar saying, how do you color correct the images in camera software provided or in Photoshop, for example, Canon provides a software for the camera and you can also use Photoshop? Too. Yeah, well, I mean, you can use either, to be honest. Um, most people don't bother with the software that comes with their camera. They usually go into Lightroom um, straight away with their raw files. And they use Lightroom uh, or they use Focus or they use Capture One and they make their initial adjustments to the raw file, which is what I do. And then I export the raw file as a 16-bit TIFF or 16-bit PSD. And then I'll fine tune things in Photoshop, but mostly in Photoshop for burn and dodge. But you obviously have the raw file processor in Photoshop as well. And it's exactly the same as the raw file processor in Lightroom. So th the difference really between Lightroom and Photoshop is Lightroom also has a cataloging um, option, which I yeah. never use really. No, um, I think if you're disciplined, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I just file my I've work in, used in it, folders no. based on clients, etc. If you use the one from the camera manufacturer, I've always found them a bit clunky. Yeah, they seem very, yeah, a lot bit, more simplistic. Yeah, and they don't, they don't always seem to be as smooth. Lightroom's a bit clunky sometimes as well. Um, so I'd say just, you know, get familiar with using Lightroom, Photoshop. It doesn't really matter. They all sort of process files in the same way. There is a slight difference in some of the systems, like Capture One, and focus for the Hasselblad will probably be better at managing their own files. So for example, Capture One is part of the phase camera system. So it's probably going to have the algorithms that are better suited to managing those camera files. Focus is going to be better at managing the Hasselblad yeah. files than uh, probably Photoshop is. But in saying that, I have processed raw files from the Hasselblad in Photoshop and it, it does do it very well. Okay, the next question is from JP Leung saying, they have an upcoming shoot for a charity that's walk-in family portraits. They were wondering if they would be okay with a Focus 110 and a 180 softbox, or if they should go for a larger single modifier like a Profoto Deep 65 inch. I think a Focus 110 could work, but you, 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 it depends on the size of the group because a Focus 110 in the focus position is making a smaller pool of light, okay, that is brighter in the center and then feathers out. So if you've got a family of four or five, then you've got a sort of centric light yeah. that's falling away. If you've got a massive para 222, it's not a problem. You can flood all of them um, and, 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 and it looks great. Um, the key thing with group shots of families as well is being careful about shadows. What often photographers make a mistake, and we get this question a lot, is about how do I like group shots? Because they put a softbox here, and then what happens is you get, a sh you get nice lighting here, and it's bright here but dark over here, and this person's casting a shadow on that person. So you have to think about your lighting, uh, and because of the inverse square law, if your softbox um, is close, then you're going to have a change in exposure more quickly here to there. If it's far away, you'll have less of a change of exposure, but you'll end up with a smaller apparent softbox, so it won't be as soft. So you've got extra complications in group shots. One great way of shooting group shots, if you've got the space, and it sounds like they will have it if it's some walking event, is set up a load of V-flats or poly boards um, and have these L-shaped, um, so, so you could have your family here, and then, you know, you, as the photographer would say be here, but you have a load of V-flats in front of the group, 
and whiteboards and you shine your light into the V-flats so you get more frontal lighting that's still very soft because you're lighting into these huge white panels. And that can be more simplistic. It may be a little bit boring, but what you can do is you can use that combined with a Focus 110 on a giraffe boom up high above, and then you can get a little bit more sparkle and bite back in it as well. So the key thing really with group shots is just even light distribution, no shadows from one person onto the next person. So you, in that respect, you need more frontal lighting, um, but you know, not letting, letting it go too, too flat, okay? Okay, the next question is from Mekai Kabakoli, and they're saying, hi, what is the best device for switching to different camera positions for content production? Do you know what they mean? Maybe they're talking more about filming for content production. I don't know, but, but they're asking no. about switching different, different camera positions. I, I'm, I'm afraid. You might that, have to clarify. Yeah, the, the question doesn't have enough information in there for us to understand fully what you mean. Um, but anyway, uh, let's take one more question, then I've got to talk about a couple more things. We've got loads more questions coming we do. in, but um, we'll, t we'll take one more and then we're going to talk about a couple of other things. Bernd Gluckert is saying, please can you give some hints for photographing transparent objects like acrylic, I think they mean acrylic glass products? Mm -hmm. Thanks in advance. Um, okay, we've got topics on this on Carl Taylor Education. If you're after a free one, Again, there's a previous Broncolor how-to video where Oz Record did a great demonstration on how to photograph engraved glass products. And he shows a technique for backlighting through the product. Um, so that might come in useful. Um, it, it very much depends on a product by product basis. We've got hundreds of tutorials on various different types of products from glossy surfaces to transparent to metallic and, and, and all different things but without knowing exactly what the scenario is what the background you want and, and what what it is you need um, then it's, it's very difficult to say the end of the day the key thing is the product is always king the product's the hero you've got to make it look good make sure your product separates from the background well so if you're doing a white on white you know you might have to bring some blacks in close so that you keep the edges of the product dark separated if you're going with a dark background then uh, you might want to think about rim lighting as a matter of fact that'll lead me nicely into into this except i haven't got it here <laughs> i'll get it up now right here's my website squarespace website um, let's take a look actually i just want to talk about so for example another technique that we've just oh, I haven't got it on here that carite oh, no. you know that carite uh, product yes with the rim lighting um, that we just we, we just did is it uh, on Instagram perhaps mm, uh, it, it may be on Instagram um, but I don't know I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get to that now but you, you can see on here right there's lots of various di types of products that I shoot all the time glossy glass backlit wrap around lighting all various styles we cover all of this over on um in in our um product photography section um now while we're on this we have to give a shout out and a big thanks <laughs> we to do. our sponsors for this episode which is squarespace this website that you're looking at here this is my commercial website this is where i post all of my different topics so this is my overview gallery here where I mix it up some fashion some product some people whatever uh, that's in my overview but then I've got a dedicated objects uh, gallery here I've got a dedicated people gallery um, and all of this is in a Wells template in Squarespace so I use the Wells template that's a question that I get asked a lot I love this template because it works really smoothly it allows me to upload my images really quickly and really easily. And then beyond that, I've been able to customize my website with extra features. I've got my about page, I've got my media articles page, putting all these extra links in, changing stuff like I've even managed to embed a previous BBC radio interview in there as well, uh, an audio file. Um, so I've got all of these other sub galleries within there and sub menus and it's all really easy to manage so that's the wells squarespace template and you can get 10 percent off a squarespace website by using the offer code carl and that is only if you want to go ahead with one when you've tried your 14 day free trial and so that's if, carl with a k <laughs> carl with a k yeah so if you're after a website for photography or other things check out squarespace and thanks to them for sponsoring the show 
Let's take another question. Next question is from Niyama Tula, who says, what is the best option to capture insect eyes, 105 millimeter macro or a 50 mil with a reverse ring? Oh, um, reverse <laughs> rings. I haven't used one of those for a long time. So you, a reversal ring basically takes the lens, like say a normal 50 mil, you take it off the camera and you yeah. turn it around okay. <laughs> and then, but the problem is you lose the contacts for the aperture yes. control. So you have to have some device or some way of mechanism of um, controlling the aperture separately. Now, I haven't used a reversal ring since the days of manual focus lenses in the Canon FD system. And we used to have to manually move the aperture pin. They don't even have an aperture pin anymore because they're all electronic. Uh, things that control it. So I'm afraid I'm not an expert on reversal rings uh, to tell you which one would be better. My guess is the macro lens is going to be better because that's what it's designed for. But it depends on what you're after is whether you're after magnification or a more flat field view. You'd have to look and see is the reversal ring with a particular lens going to give you a higher level of magnification. I doubt it's going to give you better depth of field. I would imagine that the macro is going to be designed in such a way to work better. But insect eyes are very, very small. Um, you're going to have huge problems with depth of field getting it right. I'll tell you one guy who does get it right. I haven't got his website up, but I'm going to get it up now. He is uh, brilliant at this stuff. A guy called Levon Biss. And uh, Levon Biss is actually he's a commercial... Uh, product photographer, uh, not product photographer, sort of sports and different other general commercial stuff. But a few years ago, he started work on this project called um, Micro Sculpture. And he photographs these amazing insect shots. And look at the detail that wow. he gets in these, in these shots. I mean, it's just incredible. Now, he gets that detail by using focus stacking. Um, so he's getting this incredible amount of depth of field well beyond normal you know normally you'd only have like half a millimeter if that so you, you just have a tiny bit of that eye sharp but he's got the whole creature sharp right but that image is made up of maybe 500 or more photographs wow. okay not only does he focus stack through like a whole whack of images on just one section he then has to move the insect or move the camera and then photograph the next bit of it and yeah. focus stack mm -hmm. that and then the next and then he has to do all of the um like the montaging the pieces together it's like a sure. giant quilt so a huge amount of post-processing work but if you want to see some awe inspiring um macro work uh, using focus stack on focus stacking techniques uh microsculpture.net He's also got an exhibition going around the world, various places. He, the photographer's name is Levon uh, Biss. Um, so uh, check out his work. I'm afraid I'm not an expert though on macro work to be able to answer that question fully for you. Okay, uh, we have a member popping in here, Dan Prezella, who says um, they've just purchased their membership and they want to say how happy they are with the classes. Thank you for the work, sir. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> That's always nice to hear. Um, then Mike Pierce is asking again, would you still consider the Canon 5 DSR as a top product camera or is Sony mirrorless the path I should be taking? Um, I don't know. I've, I've got my reservations still about mirrorless. Um, Tim Flack, who's a colleague of mine, have run some workshops together. We're running another workshop together here in, um, in March. Yep. Tim uses the Canon 5 DSR. He also uses the Hasselblad. Um, he's working on a new book on bird photography. If you don't know Tim Flack work, work have a look at his website, timflack.com. Um, now, Tim um, uses a medium format a lot of the time in the studio, and um, a lot of this work that you see here on his website has been shot on medium format. But he's working on a new book, and uh, he's using the Canon for the 5DSR because birds move very quickly and they yeah. skit about and jump about and stuff. So the medium format would be a bit slow for that type of photography. So he's using lots of you know, quick flashes, quick firing, and the 5DSR allows that. Now a mirrorless camera doesn't have a mirror to flip up. Essentially, we mustn't get confused about what a mirrorless and a, non, a DSLR is. They are essentially the same, just one doesn't have a mirror. A normal camera, 
call it normal, historical cameras, have a mirror where the light hits the mirror, bounces into a prism, comes out in your eye. So what you're looking at is actually real life. It's the real photons. Then when, it, when you press the shutter button to take the photo, the mirror flips up the way, out the way, and the light goes through and just hits the sensor. In a mirrorless camera, there is no mirror. The light just hits the sensor straight away, and that information is sent to an electronic viewfinder, like a t mini TV screen. And for me, I find that process a bit odd and a bit strange yeah. because it feels a bit alien to me because I'm so used to a mirrored camera. Uh, and it also looks a little bit electronic because the viewfinder, you know you're not looking at real life, you're looking at a TV screen. But in saying that, if you're shooting tethered and you're not really worried about looking through the camera for then, main yeah. things, then you might be fine with it. In terms of image quality, I don't know the specs on the 5DSR versus the Sony. They're, they're both of these cameras and the Nikons are running up into the 50 megapixels and I think there's rumours of even bigger megapixels coming as well. But your problem when you run into higher megapixels on these full frame 35mm cameras is diffraction because you're getting more photo sites squashed into a small space more prone to diffraction issues, which means you can't stop down your lens as much without getting a sort of hazy flare to the image, which reduces image quality as you stop down. On medium format cameras, the photo sites are usually bigger because you've got a bigger area, you know, to fit the pixels in, if you like. Um, so you'd have to read some tests on that. But I'd say, crucially, it's not so much about the camera body, it's about the glass that you put on the camera body. So if you find um, really high quality independent optics from Zeiss or say Canon have got better optics than Sony or Sony have got better optics. Those are the things I'd be considering more than worrying about a few megapixels on a full frame camera. Also keep in mind that Sony are now making the sensors for everyone except Canon. So Sony makes sensors for themselves, for Nikon, for Hasselblad, um, for Phase. Canon make their own sensors still, so um, that's worth keeping in mind as well. Okay, uh, next question is from John Houghton, who says, um, can you recommend a scene calibration plate for focus as you used in the St. Anne's windmill shot? What? <laughs> I was hoping you would know what they Oh, mean. I know, I that, that's when I did, I did the focus tutorial. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my shot. So I did, uh, Hasselblad asked me to do the, um, the instruction video manual, if you like, for how to use focus. And we broke it into lots of separate chapters on how to use it. And there's one section in it about using the um, colour checker card. Okay. And then using that to measure and calibrate your camera specifically to, um, to focus. The the uh, image that was used in that to do that was not my image, that was from another photographer that did that. So I don't know anything about that, that particular photo. The process of doing it, and are they they're using a Hasselblad camera that they want to do it in, in focus, do they? Um, they don't actually specify, unfortunately. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, if they're wanting to do it in focus, then yeah. it's very likely they're going to be using a Hasselblad camera. My first question would be, why do you feel you need to do it I have never had to calibrate, m custom calibrate my camera, um, my Hasselblad camera, for, 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 you know, it, for me it's pretty good as it is out the box and I don't really want to mess around with it. The only people that I do know that mess around with that stuff is actually archival uh, museums and galleries that have got a sort of set lighting setup that is used for photographing every painting and every piece of artwork. And based on that, they want to calibrate to that lighting setup, you know. But for us, we're using multiple lighting modifiers, multiple locations, multiple variabilities. So I'm quite happy with the default Hasselblad settings. Um, so the tutorial, the focus tutorial that you're probably referring to, obviously explains how it's done. If you want more information on it, and it's specifically for the Hasselblad camera, then I would contact um, Hasselblad directly through their support option and uh, speak to them about it. Okay, the next question is from Dianesh. Um, do you think camera companies are going to discontinue manufacturing DSLRs and shift completely to mirrorless? Mirrorless. I hope Sorry, not. would it be wise to invest money in high-value DSLR lenses now? Um, I hope they don't 
switch to mirrorless. I mean, mirrorless has the advantage that it's smaller, but that's essentially it. There's no image quality improvement, okay? Um, not as far as I'm aware, we're still dealing with a full frame sensor. Um, I like mirrored cameras because I like looking at the real picture. Maybe one day when they make a 10K resolution little mini screen and it looks super lifelike, then maybe I'll be convinced. Um, the, there is a couple of, of advantages with the mirrorless with the electronic viewfinder is that if you want to, when you change the exposure, it will change the exposure of what you're seeing in there. Yeah. So you can almost use it like a light meter as, as you're using it. But for me, it still wouldn't be my first choice. And I don't think mirrorless, uh, I don't think mirrored normal DSLRs are going to disappear anytime soon. If you think about it, they've been around almost as long as photography. Actually, a mirrorless was first, to be honest, because view cameras didn't have a mirror because you had the, the you know, you had the, the plate at the back and the lens at the front and you put the hood over and all the rest of it. Um, so, so mirrorless was, was around first and then uh, mirrored cameras came along, along, but they've been around for a long, long time. And I don't think there's any issue with them in, in any way whatsoever, other than they're slightly larger than mirrorless cameras. So um, I don't think they're going anywhere soon, but I could be wrong. I'm certainly not going down the mirrorless route at the moment until the EVF, the electronic viewfinder, is significantly, significantly better and feels like real life. Okay, the next question is from Undef, who's saying, I am shooting feminine portraits, and what kind of lighting do you think brings the emotional mood in the photos? Lately, I am inspired by Peter Lindbergh photos. Peter Lindbergh. Oh yeah, Peter Lindbergh. Yeah, He's the one that passed died. Away passed recently, away. Yeah. Well, Peter Lindbergh was um, exceptionally good, uh, in, especially in black and white, mm. and uh, it was also the way he he toned his prints and the way the black and white contrast range that he used as well. Um, in terms, I think he shot a lot of natural light as well outdoors. So I'm, I'm not. In, I'm not totally familiar with what lighting he may have used in a studio environment um, so what just repeat the question again though so just the get question was it. what kind of are they shooting feminine portraits? feminine portraits so what kind of lighting do you think brings the emotional mood in the photos that's a very tricky one i mean we're you know i'd consider myself an expert on controlling emotion with light but in terms of femininity that in itself can mean many things you know is it a sexy femininity? Is it a subtle, softer look of femininity? You know, we, we're dealing with very sort of fine um, specifics on whether you want, also who are you photographing? Is it a young person? Is it an older person? Because there are aspects of lighting that you can get away with young people with a harder lighting that works perfectly okay if the skin is good, but you couldn't use that same harder lighting on a 40 year old woman as easily um, because it, it's going to look different um, and, and this is really crucial because you have to consider the subject and I don't know who your subjects are or, or what sort of sphere they're in. Now obviously we know that the bigger and broader the light source is the softer the look will be and it fills in crevices because the light is coming in from all angles. I particularly like um, paras, parabolic lighting um, the 133 para as a beauty light because I can put it in a soft position but it still has a sort of sparkly hard quality to it but there's a limit I don't think I could shoot a cover of uh, you know like Madonna given how, how old she is now compared to you could shoot her with it 30 years ago um, so there's a limit to how you can push the lighting based on what you're photographing you can use hard lighting, like point light source lighting, on some models if the direction of it is very frontal, um, but that has a very hard, bright quality about it that I would not consider feminine. So you could, um, like the Para 222 though, for example, when we use that light from not, you often use that from directly from the front. So you have the light behind you as you're shooting gives a really nice wrap of darkness to the edges of the model and gives really nice texture on clothes, which is why it's used a lot for fashion. But when you take that light to the side and you spin it slightly and you've got it in a soft position, it gives a much 
more beautiful soft light than even a big soft box does. Then you can even put the additional diffuser on the front. But obviously when you're getting into that type of lighting, you're talking about very expensive, yeah. large lighting with a 2.2 meter diameter. Um, and that's gonna give that very soft looking light. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to call. If I refer back to some of my beauty portraits and we just take a look, I can try and kind of explain which lighting I used on, uh, on which. So, so here, for example, this is a Para 222 coming in from the left here that's illuminating down the face and down the body, this side. And then I've got a couple of smaller Para 88s just lighting the hair. Uh, one lighting the hair here on this side coming in from this side and one lighting the dress here. And that's the lighting and that gives a very soft, if you like, feminine look to that shot. But I'd say that shot's feminine partly because of the dress, the model, the set, the, the, the you know, everything else yeah. about it as well. And then if you, you take the same um, model and the same set with a hard lighting, we've gone very dramatic, very theatrical, very edgy, very spooky, very dark, very, by using a very crisp, hard shadow lighting. So your definition of feminine is hard to pin down because you could consider that feminine shot, but that's also ultra hard lighting from a very hard point light source, but it's used very directional to the front so that there's barely any nose shadow um, and it's level with it. So if you use it from above, you're gonna get the nose shadow underneath and shadow. But if you lower the light source down, this one's on that shot is lowered down and to, to my camera right, which is why it's casting the shadow over on this side. But I'd say it's quite feminine because of the color of the light, the tones of the image, the clothes she's wearing and the expression. So the definition of feminine how would you pin that down? It's difficult, yeah. I think it more depends on who you're photographing and what image you're trying to create. Yeah, I mean, here's, here's one. This is, a, this is a Para 133 from the front. I'd call that more fashion lighting because it's got that sort of sparkle to it and it's got this rim lighting that I put around the model as well. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard to pin down what you would call feminine or not. Would you call that feminine, which is a Para 133 up high and further away, just a single light on the model and one light on the background? Is it the model that makes it feminine? Is it the clothes? Is it the lighting? I don't know. Here's another example of uh, Para 222, large soft light coming in from the left, giving a nice broad lighting. Um, I don't generally shoot with soft boxes um, very often. Um, because I, pre I prefer parabolic lighting. Um, I'm just trying to find a situation where there may be what we could consider feminine. Um, it's hard. You could consider that shot feminine, but it's set up with three very tight Fresnel lights. You know, but is it feminine because of the model, the look Again, there? Yeah. It's, it, it's too open to interpretation. Um, I think the word feminine is just too broad to use to pin down a, a lighting style. I would suggest though, if you've got a photographer like you said, Peter Lindbergh, then look at the work and analyze the work and try to identify what the lighting is. If I can look at pretty much any photo and if it hasn't been severely retouched, um, I can tell you what the lighting is from looking at it. So practice that and get learn to how to read lighting and that give you a good indicator of if you want to emulate that style. Okay, uh, Rohan Joshi is asking, what factors do you consider before selecting a hero image for a product you shoot and how do you maintain your quality difference for your quotations? Um, I don't have really any factor of selecting a hero image because we only work on one photo. Um, I don't take multiple angles I only set up one photo. So if a client brings me a product to shoot, we are spending m multiple hours on that one product at one particular angle. And that angle of the product has usually been defined already by the art director in a sketch because they want it to be sitting like this, because copy's going here or something's going here, or it's going on this layout uh, poster or whatever, or advert. Or if I'm shooting for myself, I again, I, I, I look at the product and I identify the product and identify the angle and then I shoot for that one shot. And that affords you the luxury, if you like, 
of concentrating on lighting. Every time you change angle, you have to change lighting with it. And um, you know, some of my product shots may have many hours spent on them getting the lighting absolutely right. We can't do that multiple angles. So the hero shot is defined right at the beginning by studying the product and looking at it and defer, you know, determining right what distance do I need to be, what focal length, what angle, how am I going to do this? Then that product's fixed in that position, camera's set, then it's lit. That's how I do it. Now, we're going to have to take a... A break. Yes, because we have to do the competitions. <laughs> we do. We've got to do that. We promise the competitions. So let me move over to the competition. Hold on. Oh, hold on. Actually, before, <laughs> why don't you show people the prizes? What's first prize today in our competition? First prize is our long exposure kit. Not only the long exposure tip, kit, but the Carl Taylor <laughs> long exposure kit from Lee Filters there. Um, that is, uh, what does it include? It says on the back. It includes one foundation kit, one big stopper, one little stopper, 1.9 ND Pro Glass filter, one cleaning cloth and three lens caps. Right, so everything you need to do long exposures is in there. Big stopper, little stopper, three stop ND, glass one. That's first prize. That's worth several hundred dollars, that thing. It is. And then second prize second is... Second prize is our big stopper. Yep. The Lee Filters Just a single big stopper. big stopper. And third prize... Third prize is two lighting gel packs. So yep. one technical pack, I believe, and one... I can't effects. read it. Yeah, yep. there we go. Yeah, so those are our lighting gel packs for those in studio photography that want to gel up their speed lights or gel up their studio lights. Now, our photography competition was technology. There it is there. That was the theme of the competition. Now, just before we announce the winners, let's just look. If you want to see what the standard on our previous competitions, there's our beautiful light competition from June, March competition, our competition theme on red there from December. The future competition, our December competition, is a grand prize. <laughs> it is a Broncolor Cirrus lithium battery lighting kit that you can see there, worth $3,500. That is first prize in our next competition, which is architecture. So don't let anyone say we don't give away some good prizes, OK? <laughs> we give away some good prizes here at Carl Taylor Education. Let's take a look at the winners of this stuff for this competition. Uh, technology competition. Let me just get this open here. Uh, shortlist. Here's the shortlist. And I'm going to talk through the shortlisted images. And then I'm going to um, announce third, second, and first. So this one made the shortlist. I thought this was beautifully lit. Um, I'd be proud of that as a product shot, but it's also technology as well, if you like. But it's a very, very nicely lit product it shot. It is. It's yeah. It's really beautiful. The gradient lighting on that is is really well done. Exactly as well. right. It's not yeah. easy to do. It's got different round shapes, some solid shapes on the side as well, some flat yeah. surfaces. Really nice gradient lighting. That was by Anthony Melendez. Um, so that was the, the shot he submitted in technology. Um, this shot I really like as well. This was Yen Muller. And um, I think that was really well executed because that's so difficult to shoot. Yeah. Um, it's a cross section of some sort of glazing wall system, but it's really well done because you can see the insulation inside, you can see the cross sections, the box sections, the aluminium, you can get a sense of the, uh, I think this is a gutter and, and glass system, you can see the metal, the metallic, uh, you can see everything that you feel you need to know about that, I think that's a great shot. And it's, it's interesting because it's showing the technology of what that yeah. does. Not necessarily something you would consider technology, but the way that they've done it really brings that exactly. element to really it. Exactly, really brings so that element. So it's a element. nice different yeah. take as yeah. well. And I think it's a really nice touch with the little blue gradient yes. behind it. It yeah. goes really well. That's by Jen, Jen Muller. Um, this one is by Kane Cochran, uh, a Sonos speaker. I think this is nicely done. It's a little bit dark at the back, so the product's starting to blend a little bit here at the back. And I would have preferred to see a little bit more mm -hmm. reveal on the Sonos light, but it is still nicely lit and a good combination of the existing ambient light from the product combined with the, with the yeah. lighting and a, a lovely gradient um, in the background. The next shortlisted one is Christoph Chernechki. 
And this is a really cool shot of a Harley Davidson motorbike, which is, you know, a sort of what you consider sort of old technology. But what I like about this is the new technology in there with the yeah. digital speedometer captured perfectly. And the lighting on this is sublime. I mean, it's just beautifully lit. This would not be out of place in the Harley Davidson brochure as no. one of the uh, key uh, sort of product and technology shots. This one was a lot simpler, but I thought it was very effective. This is by Philip Becker. I like the green on the red. Um, magenta and green are opposite colors, so we've got that lovely juxtaposition there. This is just a data cable, but I actually thought as a data cable shot, it works really well. <laughs> it does. Data cabling <laughs> is all about transferring, you know, data, and it's obviously very relative, uh, relevant to technology. So I thought that was quite cool. And what I thought that demonstrated really well is that, you know, you can still make any old crap look you good. Can, you know? I mean, who would have thought that that would uh, be yeah. a finalist in a photography competition exactly. kind of yeah. thing? It's just the way they've done it. It's the way they've done it. They've thought about it. They've made the, the main hero part stand out really well there as well. Um, so, that's, so that's a good one from Philip Becker. And then this one from Quentin Aralt. Uh, technology here, they've got the, the, one of those um, DJI rigs that holds a camera, a camera stabilizer. I thought this was very good. Black on black is difficult to do, yeah. but I didn't think the rim lighting, I thought the rim lighting could be stronger because there are parts of that product that are blending into the black. Yes. So I would have liked to see a bit of back rim lighting on that to separate the product from the background, but I thought it was a good effort anyway. This one from Scott Steinwise was another shortlisted one. Well, on didn't these. Scott ask a question earlier? Did he? Maybe. I think he um, might have. Well, anyway, this was a very good effort, Scott, on um, these Samsung telephones, dancing in the air, great angles, good exposure. Love the puff powder thing going on in the background and then emulated on the screen of, of one of the phones as well. So I thought that was um, a very good um, shot. So would you like to know third place? I would like to know and I'm sure everyone else would okay. too. <laughs> third place and based on technology, based on a good image, Scott takes third prize. Well done, Scott. I thought great shot and it's obviously related to technology. Mobile phones are probably everyone's closest thing to technology yeah. they've always got in their pocket, and they're so advanced now, you can do computing and spreadsheets and everything, everything your <laughs> plan diary, your dinner. plan your dinner, the whole lot. Uh, second place goes to Christoph because I thought this was a brilliantly executed shot, fantastic lighting, and I liked this old meets new yeah, technology. You know, the new nice. technology coming into what was sort of old tech uh, product in a Harley Davidson motorcycle. So second place to Christoph. First place I'm giving to Jen Muller, and I think the reason is people might be surprised by that, but I think that's actually the most difficult shot. Yeah. I know as a product photographer, that if I was tasked with that as a shoot for a client, um, photographing that cross section like that is very clever, uh, but bringing out the key details. When I look at that picture, it describes to me perfectly what that's about. Triple glass layering in there, the guttering system, the insulation, all of the sort of things that you wanna know about, that, you, that the client would wanna know about the technology that makes that system that you can't see from the outside of it on a house, you see it in that and it describes it really well. So I thought that was a really good take on technology. Yen Muller, you're the winner of the first prize long exposure there kit. There you go. So well done there. So that was our technology uh, competition. Um, let's take a few more questions before we wrap this up. Okie dokie, we have a question from YSN saying, how do you sell your vision for the shoot to a client who, <laughs> that's a very particular client, this one, who is um, a valuable client, but stubborn and with zero imagination? How do you sell your vision? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, most of the time in what I do, the vision, if you like, is coming from the client because coming from an art director or someone who's decided how something's going to look. They obviously ask for your input and interpretation and things like that. Um, if you're dealing with a smaller client, they may have no clue about photography or how things might look good or look best. So you, you're there to suggest to them what might work. You shouldn't impose your vision too much though on a client. You never think of it as like, oh, I'm the artist 
and I need to show this lighting. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't think about it. Successful product photography is exactly what Jen Muller just did in that shot. He delivered what his clients' clients needed to see. Okay, that's the crucial thing. Don't think of your client as the end user because they are not. The end user is your client's clients. So if I'm taking a photograph of um, sunglasses or electronics or cosmetics or whatever, it's not about just what that client wants, it's about what their clients want. And that's usually dictated by a bit of market research. So you're gonna be more successful at interpreting what is good by understanding what your clients' clients need to see, okay? Because that's what it is. It's about describing a product, describing what it does, describing uh, what its purpose is. And the more effectively you describe that, the more units they will sell. And the more units they sell, the more likely it is they're gonna rebook you for photography. So it's a, it's a couple of stage process. It's not about your vision because I think you're, it sounds like they're trying to be too arty with it, you know? Like, oh, I want to put it on a floating pink piece of cotton wool <laughs> because I believe that. It's not about that. It's about what they need. And what they need, they're not always aware of. So what you should be asking them is, what do you think your clients need? What do you think the people that are looking at this picture need to know? And that is the best route. It doesn't always have to be the sexiest shot. It doesn't have to be, you know, the most incredible creation. It's about it being effective. And that's what sells products. Okay, the next question then is from Nazar, who's saying, what is the best length, for, uh, focal length for portrait photography? Is it 36 mil, 50 mil, 85, 100 or 135? What do you suggest is Well, I'm assuming length? he's talking about 35 mil full frame 35 mil. They don't specify, but yes, I yeah, would assume I'd so. say 85 mil in 35. I use 85 mil in full frame 35 mil. Uh, find 135 mil pushing it a bit to the stocky looking end. Unless you've got super skinny models you're working with, you can get away with that. But for normal people, 85 mil is a preferred focal length. It's also a nice focal length distance to work. You know, it, longer focal length pushes you further back and therefore your conversation with your subject is further away. 50 mil, you'd be right in their face and you're probably going to subject a little Might bit of distortion. <laughs> yeah, 50 mil's all right if you're doing full length and sort of fashion stuff, but if it's portrait, 85 mil would be my choice. Okay, then uh, Nassau has another question. I see you use very expensive equipment for your photo shoots, but what is the solution for a photographer who has a limited budget? Can you recommend some equipment which is not that high end? but still good enough to work with within a reasonable budget. Yeah, well, don't get blinded by the equipment, okay? I've got fancy equipment for reasons of efficiency, um, but I can tell you now, I could get a set of Godox lights. Most of the equipment I use beyond the lighting, for, especially for product photography, is much of it's homemade stuff. So as long as I've got a flash, bare bulb flash, then I can modify that with my homemade stuff to get the same results. The quality comes down to the efficiency of how fast it can, how many flashes, recycle times, how consistent the color is, whether I can do high speed work with it. Those are all the extras I pay for with the fancy Bron gear, okay? But I could turn out a good quality product shot with some speed lights if I had to, is knowing about how to use them. And then when you look at the fancy medium format stuff, I'm using that because my clients are paying for high res work, they can crop into it, but I could still turn out a damn good shot on a 35 mil camera as well. And as a matter of fact, this comes up time and time again, unfortunately, people don't seem to be able to translate the lighting and the camera into their world and think about just applying it using the same techniques. So what we're gonna do in some future tutorials is actually bring in some cheaper lighting, bring in some cheaper cameras and show you that I can turn out exactly the same result. As a matter of fact, we did do that. In one of the food shots with Anna, it was the duck leg shot. Yeah. We were shooting everything on a Canon yeah. with a sim you know, simple single light setup. And then we did the same shot on the Hasselblad and they looked essentially the same on a web page. It's only when you really, really zoomed in high you'd notice the resolution difference. So don't be bamboozled by the fancy kit. Um, if you're looking for less expensive kit, you've got Godox, you've got Elencrom, Bowens is making a comeback, I believe they've been bought by Wex or mm -hmm. Calumet or whatever it is. Um, so there are options out there. 
if it fires a good flash and it's a good full spectrum daylight color balance, then, uh, then you'll be fine. And uh, we are going to make sure in some of our tutorials, I mean, on a lot of our tutorials on Carl Taylor Education, we're using Elinchrom lighting from when before I had Bron as well. And we're going to introduce some other lighting into some of our tutorials as well, just so um, make people feel a little bit more at ease. Yeah. Um, Zhao is saying, I'm new to the channel, so welcome. Um, do you have any tutorials about food photography, like real life food <laughs> photography? <Yeah>. Wait, wait. <laughs> like, do we ever? <laughs> like real life uh, food photography, such as in restaurants and stuff. So um, we don't have restaurants. No, we don't have restaurants, but that shouldn't really affect it. We do have a new set about shooting food in your own home. Exactly. Our food section here, look, is in our product section. So go into our product section on Carl Taylor Education, jump into food photography. And what you'll see is how um, Anna and I stylize, or she does the styling on the food and I do the lighting. And um, internet's gone a little bit slow here for some reason. Um, but we basically, between us, uh, here they are, here they've come in now. Uh, you can see these are the ones coming soon. Uh, we've got raw fish, we've got shooting at home. These ones are shot in a, ho in a house using a lot of natural light stuff. And then some of these are studio ones. We've got how to make your own backgrounds for food photography, how to prepare food, how to make food look fresh, how to, uh, what props to use. We've got tons of food photography tutorials there and uh, they'd all be applicable to a restaurant scenario um, in just simply the, the lighting we've kept quite simple in most of that. So you could shoot it in a restaurant scenario. It's not the sort of thing you're going to shoot in the middle of dinner service with a load of restaurant diners. Hopefully not. When I've done food photography in a restaurant, you're doing it while the restaurant's closed in the middle of the day and the chef's there working with you. Um, but yeah, check out our, our food tutorials there. Okay, then Michael Warren is saying, is it possible to do good photography if you have zero creativity? Well, creativity is a funny thing because um, it, Creativity, right, to me, is about solving problems. That's what creative solutions are. And, and when I'm shooting some images, I'm not really thinking about creativity in that I'm trying to be creative. I'm trying to solve a problem. I'm trying to make that product look amazing, look luxurious, light it in a way that it... And each one of those steps is solving a problem. How do I make that light wrap around there? How do I identify that part of the product and bring that key light on there? What background is going to juxtapose it? So each step of it is problem solving. Creativity, in my opinion, is problem solving. Um, whether or not I've got a creative mind, um, I would say probably yes because I like to think of ideas and sketch things out and come up with things. But a lot of that is drawn from inspiration, from watching movies, reading books, other photographers, artists, etc. So you draw inspiration from everywhere. You turn that into your own creativity or problem solving. And uh, yes, I believe you, you can. And one of the things that a lot of photographers that sort of say they don't have creativity is they follow our tutorials and they try to replicate what we've done. And that's a great learning process to understanding the, how, how to go about it in many ways. Right, we've got uh, two minutes left. So we'll just take a couple more questions. And um, yeah, before we do, what's that? This yeah. is our new flash stick. Our new very USB good. stick. Look, we've got it. Look at that. It has Carl a name Taylor on it. Education. I mean, you can see it. These are reserved, I'm afraid, just for people that visit us on our workshops. And um, this, I was really interested in this because look, it's a slide in and out USB three. I haven't had a chance to test it. Totally, I haven't tested have it. No, no, I'm I'm going to test it now though. Look, this <laughs> is the most important <laughs> aspect of that. Works really well. Hmm. Nice little sip of cider there. So that's I'd a say it's a one. success. It works well. <laughs> works well. Right, let's take a couple more questions before we wrap this up. Okay. Um, then we have one from Michael Warren, who's, uh, no, sorry, we've asked his. Ted King, do you know if Broncolor will make a more portable lighting system from location? They love their products, but they're a bit bulky. Well, they they've find. got the Move Pack. I'd say the Move Pack is pretty portable because the Moby lights that go with it are really lightweight, which means when you're working on location, you haven't got a heavy lamp head. You've got the Cirrus, which are completely portable because they've got lithium battery in, the, in the, the unit, in the monoblock, but obviously that adds weight. And therefore, if you're using those in a para 
on location, you've got to sandbag it and like, have an assistant hold it. So you've got the trade-off of even having the power and the capacitor and all the heavy stuff on the ground in a pack like the Move Pack, or having it in the lamp head and adding weight. So I don't, you know, I don't say that, you know, they don't seem any less portable. For me, the choice would still be the Move Pack because I want the, the lighter weight head and then the heavy bits on the ground. Um, obviously, as technology improves, people hopefully will keep making smaller and smaller flash units, but you are limited um, to things, capacitor and battery power. So if the battery's in the lamp, you know, there's going to be a weight element and a size element for that lithium ion battery. And if the capacitor's in there as well, another element. So you've got to choose between mono block system where capacitor and power is in the head or go with a pack system like the, the move ones where the lithium batteries in the pack, capacitors, etc. in the pack. And it's just a tiny little lamp head then that's up high. So uh, there we go. OK, uh, next one is from Paris Hidden saying, I shoot sRGB and edit on an 8-bit monitor. Do you have any clients that want 10-bit files? What is your view on this? I wouldn't shoot sRGB. I'd shoot Adobe RGB for a start. Um, so on my Canon cameras, I will have them in Adobe RGB because the gamut color space is bigger. And then most of my retouching workflow is in Adobe RGB because many of my clients' work is getting converted to CMYK because it's getting printed on packaging or posters, etc. And that final CMYK conversion is done better from an S, uh, from a Adobe RGB profile gamut. Um, and that's more of the industry standard. Some people use the pro RGB, um, pro photo RGB profile, but um, all the pro retouchers I've worked with, all of the repro houses, everyone seems locked into Adobe RGB as the gamut space. So that's what I set on my cameras. If it's printing to an inkjet printer as the final stage, a lot of the inkjet printers use a rip and they use an sRGB profile for the final thing. But I still wouldn't shoot in sRGB. I'd still shoot in Adobe RGB and then make a conversion to sRGB as the last part of the puzzle. Okay, the sRGB space, if you look at the gamma as a triangle of color, the sRGB gamma is smaller than the Adobe RGB gamma, so there's more colors to work with. I also um, try to work with a 16-bit workflow right from the bat. So on the Hasselblad, I think it's a 14-bit, actual true 14-bit, then it gets converted to 16-bit, but I still convert my 8-bit files, if I'm shooting 8-bit, into 16-bit in Photoshop so that I'm less likely to incur banding or any issues uh, that might happen uh, in the file during the retouch stage. And then printing, again, in sRGB goes back to 8-bit. But again, do that last, OK? Work in as many bits as you can during the retouch and as high a color space as you can you know, during the capture stage. Do the squashing down bit last, OK? Um, that's the way I view it. Two more questions. OK, two more. Eggnog is saying, have you tried and what is your opinion about the Broncolor F160? Are they better than the other competitors such as Aperture Light? Eggnog? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad we got to ask that question. Um, the F160 LED lights he's talking about. Uh, we've just been in Switzerland with Broncolor filming some new how-to videos. We did two sh shoots, I think, with the using the F160s. I used them for a product shot. I was very impressed with them, actually. I, I'm not a fan of using continuous light because I'm used to using flash. You have to use continuous light in darkened studio space because you don't want any other light pollution. But the control in color temperature from 3200K right up to 6000K was superb. And what I really liked about them was the dome on the yeah. LED. So it wasn't a flat surface LED, it had a dome, which means it would work in a parabolic reflector because you need the light to come out the sides as well as the front. They were extremely bright. We even used them with soft boxes mm -hmm. and they had enough shine through with double diffusion and soft boxes still worked well. Uh, we're able to shoot uh, F11, obviously in a still life you can extend the exposure time, so not a problem. But the quality of the colour index was very good and that's the important thing with LED is what's called the CRI, that's the colour index. 
you need a high color index. So if you've got a light that's only scoring 85 or 90 on the color index, bits of the spectrum of light are missing. The Bron ones are right up in the top 90s, 98, I think, somewhere. So uh, almost as pure as daylight. Okay, so I can't compare them to anyone else's because I've never used anyone else's, but I can certainly tell you those F-160s are very good. Then we've got another interesting name for our final question. Curious Soul is Curious asking, soul. <laughs> how did you take the paint shot with the Ellen Crom studio lights? What flash duration is enough for that kind of speed? Which paint shot is he talking about? I'm assuming, talking about? I would think that it's the one, the paint explosion with the right. balls Well, the, the, uh, the paint explosion was done with uh, speed lights and Ellen Crom lights. So, so this, my, you know, my more recent high speed work like this stuff is all done with bronze color with with scorrows and um as a matter of fact this shot that's taken a while to load there that shot is done with bronze color with the scorrows super high fast flash speed that's a tutorial actually as well that shot um, but some of my older work before i had the bronze scorrows was uh done with a combination of speed lights this was done with speed lights only actually so with speed lights, you can get very fast flash durations. I guess that's why they're called speed lights. But the <laughs> problem with it is they're low in power. You have to drop the power of the speed light right down. And then consequently, you don't have enough power. So then you've got to cluster lots of speed lights together to get enough power. And that's exactly what I did on this shot was I clustered a whole bunch of speed lights together. But then by the time you cluster the speed lights together and all the triggers and then the the problems that they don't always fire and everything else, they become inefficient. Um, so with, that's why I switched to the, the bronze system. However, I have done um, a shot here. There was another one that I think they're talking about that one. That one was done with a combination of speed lights and Elenchrom. But I think I used, oh no, I, I'm, I know I used the speed lights for the main freezing part of the job. And I only used the Elenchrom for the background elements and the bits that weren't important in the shot so um those ellen crom speed those ellen crom lights i had there would not have been fast enough to freeze that we're talking about ten thousandth of a second yeah. fifteen thousandth of a second there um, there are lights other than brom that do it uh, i believe ellen crom have got some high speed lights but you need to look at the t0.1 measurement ignore t0.5 this is a bit of a false thing this right doesn't give you the true perspective on the flash duration and when it cuts off, right? T0.1 measurement, see what it reads in T0.1. If you're getting more than eight, ten thousandth of a second at T0.1, then you've got a good fast flash duration. The, the problem you've then got with, say, maybe Godox compared to Bron um, is consistency. It's is it the same amount of power output every time you press the button? Um, is it the same color of flash every time you push the button? And then beyond that, what you're paying for is, can you kick the thing over several times, let it bounce down some stairs on your way to a job, get paint on it, boot it, drop it, and will it still work, okay? And obviously that's what I'm paying for as well with the, uh, with the bronze stuff too. So uh, those are the sort of things to consider. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Right. I think so. Okay, we have to knock it on the head because I now have a bottle of cider to drink it's now going that I've flat, yeah. opened it. And um, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back again at some point on live on social media. But remember, our best live shows are over on carltaylereducation.com. That's where we get top celebrity photographers in to answer your questions, find out about what's going on in the industry. We've got our live photo shoot workshops on there where you can also ask questions. Tomorrow, we're shooting uh, legs, female legs in sexy stockings and different stuff showing you all of that stuff. Tomorrow's live show on Carl Taylor Education. Loads coming up on Carl Taylor Education. Loads of more courses. I'm Carl Taylor. She's Ashley. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>